at age 16, he found not only refuge, but he found Jesus in Albania. An Albanian ethnic, an ethnic Albanian, came to Albania from Kosovo, and he found the church, a church that several years back, we thought we was not going to exist because we had to evacuate our missionaries. The missionaries came back, they kept steady. When the war started eight years later, they welcomed Emir. Emir received Christ. Well, the war continues, and the Church of the Nazarene sends volunteers to Kosovo. A young man called Clayton Prescott. Layman. Not a lot of Bible training, not a lot of biblical knowledge other than Sunday school stuff, which should be enough for every disciple to make disciples. So he went to Kosovo and led by the Holy Spirit, the regional director, Franklin Cook, and the director of Nazarene Compassion and Ministries, Bob Prescott, they are driving in the midst of, of war-ravaged Kosovo. And they did not have any idea. They, if you ask Prescott, the uncle of Clayton, and Cook, the regional director, if you ask them, what prompted you to stop in the town of Shuareka, they would say, we were praying and the Spirit told us, go there. Go there. I want you to pay attention to this because the Spirit told, it still works in the 20th century, 21st century, it still works. They're driving, they're praying, the heads of the mission in Eurasia, my predecessor in Eurasia, they're driving and they're praying, where do we go? And the Spirit told them, as they were driving by Shuareka, he said, stop here. And they stopped. And they decided, almost like flipping a coin. There was no strategy. There was no grandiose, comprehensive plan. It was a bigger plan. The plan of the Spirit that said, stop here. They stopped and what do, they, what do you know? There in Shuareka, they met Emir. A 16-year-old Albanian refugee who was returning to meet his family. And he was already a Nazarene. Isn't that awesome? I get the shivers. They established a church in Kosovo. It was a church of young people. The oldest the oldest member of the church of the Nazarene in Kosovo in the year 2000 was 17 years of age. Emir was the pastor. Their mentor was this missionary. His name was Clayton Prescott, a builder, building houses. Watching at what they were doing, all these young people, there was Salim. Salim, S-E-L-I-M, Salim, was curious about this American, so he came to this, to this American and he asked him, do you know that we are Muslims? And Clayton said, I know. He said, do you know that we hate Americans? Said, I figured that much. Do, we, do you know that there is a bounty of $50 for your head? I didn't know that. Now I know. So he said, why are you doing what you're doing? Now Clayton had not been trained as a theologian. Clayton had not been trained as a, as a missionary. He was a lay person, laying blocks, building houses for refugees who, by the way, were Muslims. Clayton said to Salim, because of Jesus. What do you mean? Well, the love of Jesus compels us to do this. Oh, Salim wanted to know about Jesus. Fast forward, because I don't have a lot of time. I'm still not preaching yet. <laughs> Fifteen minutes, you said, correct? 
50. Okay, good. I was going to take 50 anyway. <coughs> Just kidding. Salem became the pastor of the Church of the Nazarene in Kosovo. They were persecuted. He was expelled from the high school. Al-Qaeda had put a bounty on his head. I met Salim in, the, in Macedonia. Macedonia, incidentally, was one of the republics of Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia, how many of you remember Yugoslavia? Okay, Yugoslavia, you remember Yugoslavia. Well, that doesn't exist anymore. It was the, the old Republic of Yugoslavia that included Macedonia, Albania, Kosovo, Serbia, Montenegro, Croatia, Bosnia-Herzegovina, all, all these countries that split in the 2000s. So now, I met Salim in Macedonia, the neighboring country. They were underground. Can you imagine being 20 years of age and being underground because of your faith? Well, I couldn't call, I couldn't call his name back then. It was 2004. So instead of calling him Salim, I call him Miles. Miles is a good American name. Miles. Plus, if you spell Salim backwards, it's Miles. Isn't that clever? Salim Miles. Okay, your name is Miles. So I named him Miles and we interviewed him. And this is what he told me. Remember, it's in Macedonia. Macedonia was the first place that the Apostle Paul reached in Europe. Acts chapter 16 tells us that Paul and his team, they had developed the strategy to reach Asia Minor. You remember, they, here's the missionary team, Paul, the ultimate missionary. They're talking and all of this, and they have a plan to go to Bisidia. And the Spirit says, no. Then, and they, go, they have another board meeting, they have the DAB meeting, and, and, and the, 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 the district superintendent Paul, they have their meeting, and they decided to go to another town in Asia Minor, and they have posters. They have all these materials and flags, and they are getting ready to launch it, and the Spirit says, no. Now, for strategists like me, I have all the degrees, in, I'm an architect, degree in planning and strategic leadership, that's annoying. <laughs> When you love to have all straight lines and cut and everything, and on top of that, you're a little bit OCD, that's annoying. But that night, Paul, Acts chapter 16, Paul is asleep and he has a, a dream. He has a vision. The vision of a, of a man from Macedonia, you remember? A man from Macedonia who says, Come. Come. So he gets up. He doesn't understand it. Because he's a strategist. Today in Turkey, a Muslim country, formerly Asia Minor, where Paul worked. Paul was a Turkish, nowadays, modern day Turkey. They call them... Saul of Tarshish, the head strategy of the Christian religion. That's his name in Turkey. That's how good of a strategist he was. So he wakes up and he comes to their team and says, Guys, forget the, pan the plans about Bisidia. Forget the plans about Asia Minor. Let me tell you what. We're going to Macedonia. What? We're going to Europe. And they go. They go to Europe. And they land in Europe in the house of Lydia. You remember that story? They go to the house of Lydia. It's very ironic that the man from Macedonia was a woman. <laughs> Isn't that weird? No, that's not a transgender statement. No, 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 no. What happens was that God is the one in charge. Right. 
Paul got it and he obeyed and he went to Macedonia. In Macedonia, he shared the gospel to Lydia and, uh, and ordained her. Lydia was the first ordinant, the first ordained elder in the entire continent of Europe. Isn't that amazing? A woman. I'm still scratching my head over that one. But why am I talking about Macedonia? Because Macedonia became the center, the center of missionary support for the entire world. Listen to this. This is what, this is what Salim quoted for me. Philippians chapter 1. Verse 3. Would you please stand as I read the word of God? Philippians 1 verse 3. Listen, listen to this. This is Paul. Paul writing back to the people in Philippi. Philippi, the capital of the province of Macedonia. Verse 3. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel. From the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about you. Since I have you in my heart, whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer. That your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for, for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, all to the glory and praise of God. Amen. You may be seated. Now this is beautiful. See, <clears throat> he is writing to the, Philipp to the Philippians. Now Philipp the, the people from... The Philippians were people who live in Philippi. How do you call how do you call the people who live in Nebraska? No, corn huskers. Uh. However, I learned something. I learned something yesterday that the vice president of the foundation, Dr. Lael, told me. We were at the table. And he showed me, he googled, that, that the corn huskers didn't used to be called that way. You remember what was the name of the Nebraska people? Bug eaters, Bug eaters yes. Isn't that amazing? No, we found a better name, the corn huskers. So he's writing to the corn huskers, to the Nebraskans. That's what basically Salim told me. He said, I want you to tell the church in Macedonia. See, the church in Macedonia has something interesting. Paul was so in love with the church in Macedonia. Because the, that, the church in Macedonia became the sending, giving church for the entire world. Let me just repeat this. The church in Macedonia became the sending slash giving church for the entire world. In fact, to the Corinthians, he's bragging about them. To the Corinthians, he's saying, I want you to know about the church in Macedonia. Who out of their greatest tribulation and poverty remember he says I want to tell you about the church in Macedonia who out of their poverty their limitations they give not only do they give they give beyond what they are supposed to give in other words they are not a 5.5% church 
For them, 5.5 is just the base. They just give. Not only they give, they beg to give. That's what he said. Not only do they beg to give, they give on themselves. Not only they give, they give and go. Amazing church, he says. Now, to the Corinthians, he's telling them that the Macedonians are poor people, very sacrificial. But then to the Romans... In Romans chapter 15, he writes to the Romans. Now, Rome is the capital, okay? It's like writing to New Yorkers, okay? To the Corinthians, he's, he's writing to the people in, uh, what is, the, what is the, the, the wealthiest county in, 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 in Nebraska? Probably somewhere in Omaha, isn't it? That one, in Omaha. So, he's, to the Corinthians, he's writing to them. So I'm going to tell you about the church here in Nebraska that in spite of the poverty and the limitations and the agricultural limitations, all of this, they are giving faithfully. He's writing to the county in Omaha. But to the Romans, he's writing to the New Yorkers. And this is what he's writing. It's fascinating. Because to the, to the Romans, he says, please pray for me because I'm taking an offering from the church in Macedonia who is taking an offering, who just collected an offering for the poor in Jerusalem, for the saints in Jerusalem. And this is what he says. Please pray because the church in Macedonia, out of their poverty, no, he said to them, the church in Macedonia, out of their wealth, are sharing with the church in Jerusalem who are poor. In exchange, in exchange, the church in Jerusalem is giving to them out of their spiritual wealth for the church in Macedonia who is wealthy but spiritually poor. Isn't that fascinating? That the church in Macedonia for the Corinthians was a poor church. But for the Romans was a wealthy church. Because it all depends. Economy of scale. Here's a good example of economy of scale. One of my blessings as a general superintendent has been to be in Cuba. In fact, two weeks ago, we, I was chairing the district assembly in Oregon. When we heard that a plane crashed carrying 10 <coughs> pastoral couples from Cuba. Rachel and I had been at, their, at one of their houses eating their food. It was, it was hard. In fact, that Sunday, I'm not, a, I'm not a gardener, but that Sunday I went and I, I knelt an entire Sunday under the rain, under the sun, and I dug 20 holes on my yard and I planted 20 evergreens. I was, fortunately it was raining because I was sobbing just to think on the 20 Nazarenes who had lost their lives. Not only they had lost their lives, that was almost like half of the district leadership was gone. Secretary, treasurer, NMI president, the key pastors of the district. The DS survived because he decided to drive those who could not afford the plane. So he was in, in his car that, that fits seven, he had 10 people. But the highlight of being in Cuba was that at the end of the district assembly, for the last 50 years, the Church of the Nazarene in Cuba stands up and they give the general superintendent an envelope. The last two years they gave me an envelope. It was an envelope containing $400. $400. That was their WEF contribution for the year. Now $400, we're probably going to spend $400 at lunch today. That will not be an exaggeration. But in context, the average salary of a person in Cuba is $10 a month. 
pastors are not considered employable by the communist government. So pastors only receive a payment from the offerings which average six dollars a month. So when they gave us four hundred dollars, that's the equivalent to two months of salary of all pastors in Cuba. That's WEF. WEF is not a matter of how much we give, it's a, it's a matter of how much we partner. Yes. So Paul is telling the church, I thank God every time I think of you, church in Macedonia. When I talk to the Romans about you, I tell them that you are poor. Of course, it's Rome. But when I talk to the Corinthians about you, I tell them that, that you're wealthy, or vice versa. Because he's relative. But one thing he says, I love the church in Macedonia. Every time I think of him, I thank God because of the partnership in the gospel. See, the church in Macedonia had assigned one person. His name was Epaphroditus. The role of Epaphroditus, it, it was, it, we, we, we read the scripture and we kind of rush through him. We rush through him because he's a name that, oh, you're not going to call your, your child Epaphroditus. <laughs> you're going to call him Paul, Peter, John, Matthew, Epaphroditus. That looks like a disease, doesn't it? <laughs> Come here, laryngitis. <laughs> we, we don't really pay attention to Epaphroditus, but let me tell you about him. He is the NMI of the early church. His job was to travel all over Macedonia and collect offerings and then he will take the offerings to Paul so that Paul could continue with the missionary work. That's you. You represent Epaphroditus. Sorry I gave you a pathological name. <laughs> and you travel across your Macedonia raising offerings for those who are in the front lines, whether training or leading or implementing. It is no wonder that Paul, every time he wrote to Macedonia, every time he thought about them, he said, I thank God every time I remember you because of your partnership in the gospel. Salim now is a 30-year-old <laughs> young pastor. They moved to Pristina the capital of, uh, of Kosovo. And now they established a church among the college students in Pristina University. And we have a vibrant, vibrant Christian church in Kosovo. I met with them. Every time I meet with them, I just rejoice. Because everything started because of a... <laughs> pyramid scheme. Somebody offered them a 10 to 1, a 10 to 1 investment proposition. <laughs> Our missionaries had to leave the country. In the process, we had a mirror, and a mirror shared the, the gospel with his friend Salim. Salim became the pastor, and now the two of them, Batman and Robin, <laughs> they're taking over Kosovo for Christ. Now, let me tell you a more personal story about a thousand to one proposition. I grew up in Guatemala, a town of San Jerónimo, a town of about 2,000 people. Uh, very rural. My dad was a telegrapher. Over the years, over the years, I, we moved to the city. That's a different story. It's going to be a different book. Um, Moved to the city, I became an architect. Through mysteries of the Lord, I, I met this missionary who was responsible for work and witness. The, the work and witness concept started in the 80s. 
And I was an architect and I decided to volunteer my services as an architect to the Church of the Nazarene. So it was brand new. A lot of people wanted to come to rebuild homes in Guatemala after the earthquake and, and after the widows and orphans program. So my partner and I, a colleague and mentor, we, we volunteered our services and we designed, supervised, and accompanied 75 work and witness teams for the building of 75 churches in Guatemala. I thought all my life I was going to be an architect doing architectural stuff and being just a good layman. The Lord had different plans, brought me to the States through a series of mysteries that you're going to hear in another book, another story, another day. I answered the call to be a missionary. My wife and I left from here to the mission field. We came to study, to be an architect, blah, blah, blah. The Lord had a different plan. He just, he just brought us here so that we could go to the mission field. We went to the mission field. Years later, I became the director of Nazarene Compassion and Ministries. As the director of Nazarene Compassion and Ministries, another story, another book. I go back to Guatemala, 92, there had been an earthquake in El Salvador. Just like I dream about going this week back to Guatemala, and a volcano exploded on Sunday and killed over 100 people and displaced, affected 1.7 million people. I can't go this week, but the church is there. I went as a director of NCM back to, back to the MAC region at that time, and uh, I heard that Stanley Story and Norma were retiring as missionaries. Now he was the one that I used to work in work and witness all these years. So since he was retiring, my sister, who became their company, their construction firm, became partners with the missionaries, the stories, in building all these churches. So my sister said, you know what, that Stanley and Norma are retiring. And I said, oh really? So I went to talk to my dad. Hey dad, do you know Stanley's story? And my dad said, oh I know him, El Gringo. <laughs> and, I, and, and, I, and I said, how do you know him? I mean, what are the odds? I didn't know him. I was in college. I was in the city. My dad, he grew, you know, grew up in the countryside. And, but he was excited. El Gringo, he said. So how do you know him? So he went to get his, his photo album. It was a shoebox. You have those. <laughs> See, that's universal. So he got the shoebox and he started and he, and he he grabbed it and he showed me. There used to be a black and white photo. Now it's a it's a yellow and brown Polaroid. <laughs> you have those too. So in that picture, my dad couldn't wait. In that picture, there is thirty-year-old blonde Stanley Story, tall, with thirty-year-old blonde curly-haired Norma from California. Very young missionaries, long skirts, long sleeves. You know, you know that you know the thing, glasses and everything. <laughs> and they're standing there, and they are baptizing my parents in the countryside, in the bush of Guatemala, where there were more mosquitoes than people. <laughs> they're baptizing my parents. And my mom has a one-year-old baby in her arms. The baby has glasses on. <laughs> of course, they are praying away and everything, and I'm looking at the camera. <laughs> we made a copy of the picture and gave it to Stanley. We framed it, put a lot of nice words, and when we gave it to him, Stanley looked at me and he said, Gustavo, I've spent 34 years of my life in your country. One day, you're going to spend your life in at least 34 countries. That was 1992. In 2003, I was elected general, uh, uh, regional director for the Church of the Nazarene in Eurasia. And we had church in 34 countries. Ten years later, I was elected general superintendent, responsible for 162 countries. 
2.5 million Nazarenes. What would you tell you if I offer you a thousand to one investment proposition? Only in the hands of God. Salim was very thankful, so am I. I don't know how much did it cost back then to send the stories to Guatemala. And even if only one family would have been saved, that was worth millions. Because it was my family. I thank God every time I think of you because of your partnership in the gospel. Being convinced of this, that he who started the good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Thank you and may the Lord bless you.